Alright, so let's continue talking about finite volume schemes for solving conservation laws. So last lecture we focused mostly on the Burgess equation and we started uh, introducing what is finite volume schemes and we first uh, looked at a central averaged flux reconstruction. Right, so flux reconstruction is what makes one finite volume scheme different from another finite volume scheme because otherwise all finite volume schemes are pretty much the same. It stores the volume averages of small cells in the domain. And then you plug in the integral form of the differential equation. The integral form of the differential equation tells you that the time derivative of the total integral, which is the volume average times the size of the volume, is equal to a summation in 1D or integral in more than 1D of the fluxes through the boundary. Now the only thing you have to do is to approximate the flux at the boundary using the information we have which is the volume averages. So that is what we need to do uh, in finite volume and that approximation is called flux reconstruction. Right, so we talked about uh, the central average way of performing flux reconstruction Right, it works most of the cases except for it produces oscillations near shock waves. Then we also discussed a, a better way to prevent the oscillations around shock waves. That's the upwind scheme, right? So although the central difference, uh, the central scheme is second order, and the upwind scheme is first order, but doesn't have oscillations around shock waves. So before we go further this lecture, let's first look at uh, two different conservation loss. One is the traffic flow equation, which is the project that is uh, due next Wednesday. And uh, another is the Beckley leverage equation. And these equations are going to give you a different flavor uh, in what kind of a conservation law you might encounter. And uh, that provides us a basis of constructing more... So the traffic flow equation is the kind of equation you see in the project. So the time derivative of how much traffic it is in a highway, it is, uh, is governed by a flux that is expressed as a function of the density, let's say if it is zero, and the flux as a function of density is equal to how many cars or how much traffic is passing by a particular point per unit amount of time. It is equal to the density itself times of velocity, let's say u. And the u here, we represent it as a function of rho. So as common sense tells us, as the rho increases, the u would decrease. So for, for example, uh, a, common, a common way to express u as a function of rho is that, let's say this is where people would normally drive if, if there is no other traffic, right? And it's pretty much constant at a point where, at some point, uh, my velocity would start to decrease because there are just uh, too much traffic. And there is usually a point where there are so much traffic on the road that the traffic is completely stopped. So, so usually u as a function of rho is something like that. And uh, in reality, you would uh, make observations and uh, construct such functions from data. In our project, we just manually uh, use an analytical function to, to approximate this. Now, if you have such a rho, uh, have a, such a u, my f flux as a function of rho would be like this, would go linearly uh, upward in this flat region, and then it curves down and draw back to zero. So this, this is an interesting example because the flux function as opposed to in the Burgess equation u square over 2, this flux function is in the mathematical sense concave, right, as opposed to convex. So the curvature is negative, the second derivative is negative. And we're going to look at how that affects flux reconstruction. Because think of the characteristics. For Burgess equation, the characteristics df du would be an increasing function of u. Here, the characteristics d 
df d rho would be a decreasing function of rho. That means the characteristics for larger rows would go backward, would go towards your left, and the, uh, the characteristic for smaller rows would go towards your right. right? So it's opposite of Berger's equation in this case. So um, df d rho would decrease as rho increases. Okay, so this is one of the cases we want to consider that's uh, different from Berger's equation. Another example is the buckley leverett equation. The buckley leverett equation is an equation that is derived from the behavior of two-phase flow in porous media. So for example, in oil reservoir engineering, that's the kind of equation people solve to look at the fraction of water in the reservoir. Okay, so ds dt would be plus uh, the flux, d flux dx equal to zero in the absence of wells where you inject or inject water or produce oil. And here, what's interesting is that f as a function of s is neither concave nor convex. So S is the fraction of water. So it, of course it goes from 0 to 1, right? Because that's a fraction. And the flux would be something like this. So when the saturation is small or when the saturation is large, the amount of, the amount of flux, which is basically the amount of water that goes through a particular point, would be pretty much constant. And it rises very rapidly as S goes in between um, a, a small interval. So if you think of the behavior of this conservation law, df ds, so here S is the conserved quantity, S is the variable we are solving for, would be first an increasing function and then a decreasing function as S increases. Right, so this is an example where you have pretty much uh, pretty complex behavior you would expect in a conservation law. Okay. Okay. So so let's let's for example let's go to MATLAB and look for some cases. So let's say traffic. If I look at the behavior of the traffic equation, and uh, let me try to see. So this is the, my initial condition. Uh, zero is no traffic. One is so full of traffic the, that the traffic stops. And if I draw an increasing and decreasing function, what I would see is that it's, well, the behavior is opposite to the Burgess equation, where at the high, the, when the solution is high, the, the solution goes towards the left. When the solution is low, the solution goes towards the right, right? As a result, you see a discontinuity form over here, where the discontinuity, as opposed to Burgess equation, where the discontinuity, the shock wave, is always a high solution on the left and a low solution on the right. It's the opposite. We have low solution on the left, high solution on the right. So this is because of the concave behavior of the flux function. All right. So that's a, a interesting case where basically you see here this is a very distinct shock where for example if you have you have very little traffic over here and you have traffic jam on the right so any cars is going to travel over here is going to be basically bumping into the shock wave and stop. The Buckley leverett equation is quite different. So let me draw another uh, place where I have the saturation increasing and then decreasing. Let's see what is that behavior. Okay, so we can see that the solution is different. So we ha in, in the lower part of the solution, the, the saturation is still very small, right? And uh, the speed, the characteristic is an increasing function of S. But at, when S goes larger, the characteristic is a decreasing function of S. So there is a shockwave forming 
that is not the entire solution, but it really only starts from here, right? And it only starts, it can only start um, when the characteristics starts to bump into, into each other, when the characteristic speed on the left is higher than the characteristic speed on the right. So, so we, we can see that this kind of uh, uh, behavior becomes quite interesting when we have some part of the flux function being concave, some part of the flux function being convex. And this has important consequences when we look at the behavior of a discontinuity.